And we don't want to touch it because um, we don't want our scent on there. So one of the core principles of integrated pest management is determining how you deal with those pests based on thresholds. In other words, how many of a certain kind of pest you have in an orchard, what the population is. And one of the ways that we determine that is using these uh, pheromone traps. Basically, it's a, a trap that has a pheromone specific to what we're trying to catch. In this case, it's oblique banded leaf roller, OBLR. And it's one of the three types of moths that we're trying to determine uh, you know what the population is here um, so we were trapping for these guys and then we already have traps up for um, oriental fruit moth which comes fairly early in the season we usually get a catch of that coddling moth would be the next one we put out and then this week we're putting out oblique banded leaf roller uh, because we should be starting to get the f flight of the first full generation of those that are coming in. A generation ago, people were basically spraying by the calendar. Um, in other words, at this date, you would spray X uh, material to take care of these particular pests, whether they were there or not, um, because people weren't specifically scouting to see what their pest levels were and they weren't working with thresholds. In IPM, you have to get to a certain population level before you decide to treat. When I first started growing apples, uh, it was a calendar thing. You know, 4th of July, you got up early and you sprayed your orchard for apple maggot. That was the first apple maggot spray of the year. And then every seven to 10 days after that, depending a little bit on whether or not it rained, you kept a pesticide coverage on your apples for apple maggot. Um, in the late 70s, we had a researcher come into New England at University of Massachusetts named Ron Procopy. And Ron thought about things a whole lot different. And, and at one of the, the winter conferences, Ron raised his hand and said, you know, I've studied a lot of bugs and he said, I've never found one yet that's got a calendar. He says, how do you think they know that they're going to start on the, on the 4th of July? And that started us thinking down this road of we need more knowledge about this. And uh, Ron started on a process of identifying when the apple maggots were actually appearing. And lo and behold, it does vary every year. Uh, but almost uniformly, at least in our part of the woods up here in New Hampshire, it wasn't on the 4th of July. We were fortunate here in New Hampshire that we had a, a new entomologist whose name was Alan Eaton. And one of Alan's jobs was to bring this new concept called IPM out to the growers. That was really the start of IPM. And of course, I was young and fresh out of college. He knew we'd have a tough sell with some of the more, shall I say, seasoned growers, uh, convincing them that they needed to change their ways. Uh, but Alan was very smart and went right after it after the money and said, I can save you money if you follow this program. And the first thing he went after was apple aphids. And he convinced us all that if we didn't spray for apple aphids, there would indeed be predators that would come in and take care of the task force for free. And that, that was an easy sell, and it was a, a really slick way to sort of get the concept going with all the growers. It worked. Threshold depends on the insect, but um, we're looking at, we check it once a week. So we're looking at you know, 10 or 12 probably per trap, uh, and that's probably right at threshold. So what I'm, I'm looking to... So we're about to hang this oblique banded leaf, leaf roller trap in the tree up here. And one of the advantages this will give us is we know they haven't flown yet, just based on past history. So we'll check the trap regularly, and when we catch one oblique banded leaf roller, we'll know that the first generation, or the overwintering generation, has flown. And we could, by keeping careful records of the weather, we can count the, the degree days until the eggs that that first generation lays will hatch. So we'll have a pretty good idea once we start catching oblique banded leaf rollers when they're really going to blow up, if they even do. Uh, the another advantage of the trap is that we check and monitor them at least weekly and as Brian mentioned the thresholds will uh, tell us. So if, if we're catching you know one moth per day we can go look at, at uh, you know some guidelines and decide okay does one moth per day constitute an infestation? No. You know we'll just continue monitoring and if 
and if things go the way we'd like them to go, we'll never have to treat for oblique bend and leaf rollers, but thanks to the trap, if we do have to treat, we'll know exactly when and exactly what the pressure of that pest is. Inside you can see a little rubber cap, it looks like a pencil eraser. That's a pheromone. So that's a synthetic pheromone that mimics the mating pheromone of the oblique landed banded leaf roller. So when they want to mate, they'll still sense this pheromone and they'll fly into the trap and just get stuck on the sticky stuff inside. The curculio was actually a weevil. It's a hard shelled insect with a long snout. Uh, and those are the adults. And the basic life cycle is that they overwinter as adults, typically outside of the orchard because they're looking for nooks and crannies and stone walls and places like that and they like a forest environment. Uh, but they need a piece of fruit to lay their eggs. The adults fly in in the spring, kind of hang out, mate, and then the female lays the egg in the fruit and typically the larva will crawl through the fruit and fruit will fall on the ground. Uh, this can result in huge losses and she likes to make these little half moon crescent scars in the fruit of which to lay her egg. But she'll go from fruit to fruit to fruit and make a scar, nope that one's not perfect, nope let's make a scar, go to that one, it's not perfect. So it's really, they can do a lot of damage in, in a short period of time. Then this particular 10 acre block of mostly Macintosh, uh, we had 12 trees that we put these attractants in, red solo cups. If you look in there, you will see that there's a little plastic vial that has the attractant odor in it. And that's what we're using. We're dragging them here. Now, what we did this year is if you look at the next tree, uh, in the process of figuring out what attracts them, we also figured out sort of what repels them. And so we were wondering, okay, so if we can attract them, if we sort of push them from the other trees to this one, uh, then we're doing an even better job. What I'm looking for, um, typically, Earlier in the season, we'll start seeing a few green apple aphids, which are typically not a huge problem. But uh, what I'm looking for are curled leaves, usually in these bigger, older trees on the inside of the tree. Um, some curling, which is aphids, could be green apple aphid or rosy apple aphid, which can be a little bit more of a problem. What I'm looking for is evidence of the predators, the beneficials, eating those aphids, which is what I'm finding. They're, they're not a lot of live ones, so that's what we want to see.